morning. My name is Lauren Watchkin. I'm the Director of Alumni Experience here at MIT Sloan. We're thrilled to have you back on campus. Thanks to everyone who came out last night. If you have any questions or concerns about the class dinners, I'm the one you can talk to, so come speak to me. I'm so happy you're here today. I had the pleasure of sitting in on Miro and Arthi's class during executive electives this year, and when I heard them speak, I knew that we had to have them at reunion. So I'm thrilled to be able to introduce them today. Miro Kazakoff, MBA 11, a fellow alum, is a senior lecturer in the managerial communication at the MIT School of Management here, Sloan School of Management, and the author of Persuading with Data, which you'll hear about today. Arthi Meharotra is a senior lecturer in managerial communication here at MIT Sloan. Prior to joining Sloan, Meharotra held senior executive roles in technology, media, and finance. Most recently, she led Uber's US and Canada operations. Arthi holds an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, but we won't hold that against her. <laughs> Both Miro and Arthi have been recognized by Sloan students as the Sloan Teacher of the Year, and we're thrilled to be joining their classroom today. Please join me in welcoming Miro Kazakoff and Arthi Meharotra. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's so nice to see a couple of familiar faces here in the audience today. Uh, what you're going to get is this is the beginning of the class that I teach with Arthes that we talk about on our very, very first day of class to set things at a really high level. Um, this is exciting for us to get to talk to a group of people we don't get to, but a little nerve wracking because how many people took this class? I don't want to disagree with you. But the first year this was offered was 2016. So is that EMBAs taking it? or s That's what it is. OK, that's why. Um, so my apologies. Those of you who have seen this show beforehand, please laugh at all the jokes. Please pretend like this is fresh and new. Um, and we'll head into it. Our topic today is why your expertise, why the fact that you are good at things actually gets in the way of you being a more effective communicator and we'll talk a little bit about what you can do about it. So by the end of the talk today, you're going to better understand um, how humans take in information. We'll talk about that at a fundamental level, the psychology and neurology. We'll talk about why experts are worse communicators than people who are often novices in their domain, that there's some things about us as experts that get in our way. And we will send you off with a couple of tips on how you can be a more effective communicator. Today we'll talk about mostly slides um, and graphs and visual design, but we'll have time for questions at the end. We can expand it to any uh, domain that you want to talk about. So we're going to start at the very, very highest level with what is communications? We're really, really big here. And I'm going to submit to you for today that one way to think about communications is a process of encoding, transmitting, and decoding information. We are at least somewhat back in a business school classroom, which means I have the ability to cold call. Um, it's an ability we reserve for all environments. <laughs> I do it on my family at, uh, at dinner, and they, they really don't appreciate it. But we do have a few people here who took the class beforehand. Was someone here who took the class beforehand? So they're chestering at each other. Uh, <laughs> Brad, I'm gonna, give it, I'm gonna give it to you. Brad, what, what does encoding and decoding mean in the context of communication? And for questions, do we have a mic um, for later on? All right, well, Brad, we'll have you do it. Uh, someone can run the mic down here for later on, but Brad, I'll have you do it, and then I'll repeat back to the audience. As best you remember, from how many years ago? A year and a half. Okay, <laughs> let's see if from 18 months ago, a mere 18 months, he can remember the beginning of class. What do we mean by encoding and decoding? All right. Oh, come on. It's the first comment of the day, and you didn't get called on. Let's be more enthusiastic than that. Woo! All right, so yeah, Trans encoding, decoding, and transmitting information. Roughly repeating what I said, I'll add on a little bit of more nuance there. So encoding. We have ideas in our head, complex, nuanced ideas. And there's actually really only two ways that we can push those ideas to other people. We can use light waves in the form of pictures or graphs or words that I write, or sound waves 
in terms of the noises that, that I make and the sounds that I say. Theoretically, you could transmit through any of the senses, smell, taste, and touch. We don't, we, we discourage that in a business environment. It's like not cool. So we're gonna stick with light and sound here. And so encoding is the process of choosing how do we take these ideas and represent them in light and sound so they can be transmitted. And then decoding is that process on the other side where those ideas are taken in by you as the audience and turned back into information. And in that process is where everything goes wrong. All of the problems. So I'm gonna illustrate a couple of the problems right now with a very simple example. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up on here on this screen, I'm gonna put up an encoding, a pretty simple encoding. And what I want you to do is I want you to notice what does your brain decode this to? What's the very first thing that your brain decodes this as? Try to really zoom in on that moment. It's called metacognition. So we think about thinking. All right, so I'm gonna put an encoding up here. I'm gonna ask you what your brain decodes this to. Ready? I can see all of you, so it is helpful if I get some more visible response. Are you ready? Okay, great, there we go. Okay, there, what does that decode to for you? What does that decode to for you? Two bars. Two bars, how about you? Number 11. Two. Number two. World Trade Center. What was that? World Trade Center. World Trade Center, great. Other ones we haven't heard yet? Equal sign, turn 90 degrees. Pause. 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 Great. All right, so, what was that one? Emoji. Emoji, yeah, beginning of the eyes of an emoji. Great. All right, so, really simple encoding up here, right? Decoded different ways by different people in this room, even people with same training. We're all students here, you're all exposed to a lot of similar concepts. Let me put another one up here. And again, try to notice what's the very first thing that this decodes to for you right when I put this up on the screen. All right, this one here. All right, what does that decode to for you? Two. Two. Anyone have a different decoding <laughs> than two? No, okay, very consistent. Um, sometimes what people say when we do this, sometimes what people say is they say, oh, it's the number two, which is the very reasonable, casual way that we tend to talk about this. But what I want to point out today is that this is, it's not quite the number two. This very specific squiggle, as best I understand it, first developed by Hindu scholars and then formulated and promulgated through the West by Arabic scholars. This very specific squiggle is a way we've chosen to encode the idea of two. And even if we didn't have this squiggle, there, there would still be some idea of two-ness that exists in the universe, right? But we've been exposed to this one so frequently, and it's reinforced so often, that we tend to fuse the ideas in our brain and to see the encoding as the same thing as the concept which it represents. But what I want you to do for today is just you know, like crowbar those ideas a little bit apart to recognize that the encoding is not quite the same thing as the idea which it encodes. Something that becomes really important in communication when we graph information and we choose words, we are choosing encodings to represent ideas. They're not quite the same thing as the underlying ideas. They never will be. Let's do another one. Again, I'll put this up here, try to notice what does this decode to for you? Ah. What does that decode to for you? Don't know. How about you? You got anything? <coughs> kind of equal, but not sure. Kind of equal, not sure. Stairs. Stairs. Okay, we probably have a couple of hands here. Anyone have a confident decoding for this? Like a really fast confident decoding? What's the, how, do you, how do you decode this? It's two. Now, why do you see two and, and, and no one over here saw two? Yeah, so this is the Chinese character for two. Ah, uh, yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, so for like a billion and a half people on the planet and 20% of this room, that decodes to two just as fast as the one above it does. But if you're not familiar with it, if you're not exposed to it, it doesn't decode in the same way, which talks about how decoding works and how sensitive it is to the audience. Let me do one last one. That one there. All right. What do you think that decodes to in this context? <laughs> two. Two. 
Great. I heard other people say it. Yeah, yeah, we get it. <laughs> get it. Talk us through the why. Why does that? Because if you saw this in another thing, you would probably decode that as 10. Why did you decode that as 2 here? Well, it's binary for two, yep. that's one part. And the other thing is all these other things are two, so yeah. I'm, by association, I think yeah. this is also two. I'm going to guess it's the association that was more powerful than every time you see a one and a zero, you think two. I'm guessing. <laughs> guessing. Yeah. So context matters, right? And this actually is really important when we work in a business context. Because this means the information people were exposed to that you can't see. like what they were exposed to in a prior meeting, right before they got into the meeting with you, can influence how people decode even simple concepts. Because we're very, very sensitive. And so here's the main challenge of communication, which is that when we're communicating, one brain encodes information. But we need multiple brains to decode it. One brain encodes but we're trying to have multiple brains decode it. And that decoding is tremendously sensitive to a variety of factors. We've seen some of them here. Your prior experience matters, the type of education you've had matters, even biological factors, in the case of things like colorblindness, influence how people decode information. So the ways in which you choose to encode that information really have a big deal. So when we're thinking about how to communicate effectively, one critical thing to remember is that every mind decodes differently. And those differences that seem like they would be very small can often be very, very big. So this decoding thing, that's a challenge that happens in the mind of your audience, right? And audiences decode information differently. There's another challenge in communication that actually is going on in your own mind that makes it more difficult for you to communicate. All right, so in a moment, I'm going to have you play the uh, metacognition game again. I'm going to show you an image, and I'm just going to ask you all to shout out what you see. All right, now, there may be a small number of you that have seen this exact image before, and if you have, we're going to have you hold off because we don't want you to ruin it for everyone. But otherwise, feel free to shout out what you see. Don't overthink it. Just shout it out. Oh, that was anticlimactic. Let's, let's try one more time. OK, shout it out. A rose. a rose. Yeah, sure, a rose, a flower. How many of you see the dolphin? How many of you see the dolphin? <laughs> Mira definitely sees the dolphin. <laughs> a few of you see the dolphin. OK, more and more hands going up. OK, up, oh, yep. People are seeing it. Please help your neighbor out if they don't see it. <laughs> Be a kind neighbor. That's nice. See Sloaning helping, Sloanies helping Sloanies is real. Sloanies. It's real. <laughs> Sloanies helping Sloanies, I love it. OK. Anyone not see it? Well, I don't know whether you want to admit it or not, but a few people don't see it. I'm going to help you out. Oh. Oh, there it is. Dolphin just hanging out in that rose. Now everyone sees it, right? OK, so now that you know it's there, now that you're primed to see it, note that you can't unsee the dolphin. Try it. Try to not see the dolphin. <laughs> it is almost impossible, right, now that you know that it's there. And it's because of this phenomenon, this phenomenon known as the curse of knowledge, this idea that once we know something, we forget what it was like to not know it, right? Once we've seen something, we can't unsee it. We can't unknow what we know. And this is the curse of knowledge, right? We've all felt this before. And the problem with the curse of knowledge when it comes to data is that when we are doing the analysis or our team is doing the analysis, you, know, you get really comfortable with the data. You essentially become an expert in the data. You know, you're deep in the analysis, right? When you get your insight, right, that you then want to communicate to someone else, you have to rewind to what it was like before you knew the data. Because that is what it's like for the audience. And that is really hard to do as humans. So the curse of knowledge 
often contributes to more complexity than the audience can absorb, right? It's not complex to us. We've been sitting here with the data. We get it. But for the audience, it can feel quite complex. It often leads to this idea that our belief is clear when it's really not, right? Or excuse me, our, our point is clear to the audience, right? And the audience goes, what the hell are you talking about? I, this is the first time I've ever seen this data, right? And it makes it really hard to predict how an audience will react. Because to do that successfully, what do you have to do? You have to rewind to what it was like, right? So actually, the cur we all suffer from the curse of knowledge. And we, we suffer from it even more the more of an expert we are, the more we understand the data, right? And so we have to constantly fight the curse of knowledge to put ourselves in the audience's shoes. Now, th this is, again, very difficult to do. We, I would say, we, Miro and I, have probably seen hundreds and thousands of tactics on how to overcome the curse of knowledge, how to communicate more effectively. We have tried to curate into the four most effective things you can do to be a clear and strong communicator. And Miro will kick us off talking about the first one. All right. So, very first thing you need to think about. We're going to move into some practical tactics here. The very first thing to think about, and for this, aim to share one idea at a time. <laughs> Audiences can handle more than one idea. It's how we communicate with each other. But it is hard for us to take in more than one idea simultaneously. So we'll do another visual example of this. I'm going to put uh, this field of numbers up here. What I'd like folks to do is count the number of nines that are on here. Yeah, that's OK. So I'm going to make two changes here, just two, just two. And I bet you'll be able to do it really quickly. I'm going to make both changes simultaneously. Here we go. All right, how many nines? One. one. Yeah, there's one nine on here. So I did two things. Go back. First thing I did was I changed the color of the nine. That color that is in that color is cardinal, which is the MIT color. It is absolutely not crimson, which is a mistake that some people make that is not cool. Um, that, is cr that is cardinal. It's cardinal. And then the other thing that I did is I actually removed um, focus from the rest of everything else. There's a temptation that we have when we want to focus people on ideas is that what we often do is we often add things to the slide. So a very common way to do this would be um, probably someone prepares an analysis for you, and you're like, ah, the nine isn't clear enough. Let's put a big circle around the nine. right? And then you hand that up to a more senior person. They're like, that's, that's not enough. Let's put a big arrow pointing at the nine, <laughs> some text in a starburst that says, like, there's a nine here. It's our bias to add things visually but that actually you can be much more effective if you take things away. And so one way to focus on one idea at a time, well, the first one is you have to actually know what idea you're trying to, trying to focus on, which m many people fail to do. It's very obvious when other people do it and less obvious when you're doing it, is to have a clear thing that you want people to focus on, clearly visually focus on it. And one way to do that is to remove um, what we're going to talk about is ink from everything else, to remove the focus on everything else. Turning them gray is actually a very easy way to do this. But the critical thing is to have one idea at a time. Notice what happens when I add in a bunch of other colors on other numbers, how the focus on the nine also goes away. This is the equivalent of trying to make multiple points simultaneously. It actually weakens our ability to see and focus on any of the points. So let me, let me look at where we're transitioning between Arthi and I to make sure I'm still going here. Where do I go on here? Keep going. Okay. Um, great. All right. So the, uh, let me give you an example here. In this particular example, this is a scatter plot. This looks at a hypothetical ice cream shop, Ezra's ice cream shop. And it looks at a comparison of every point on here is one day of sales over a single summer. Along the x-axis, what the average temperature was on that day. And on the y-axis, what the sales were for that day. So you can see, for example, there was a one day that it got up into the 90 degree mark and did about $35,000 in sales on that individual day. 
So there are, even with this reasonably simple graph, a couple of different points that you could make. You could try and make the point that there's a pretty clear correlation between temperature and daily sales. Uh, the higher the temperature is, the higher the sales of ice cream tend to be. You could make a different point about how almost all of the outliers that don't tightly fall in this correlation can be explained by various things, Memorial Day or a music festival or a tropical storm. Um, this is named after all of my nieces and nephews, and Zoe is still shitting on me that I've made her, that she doesn't get to be a person, that she's just a storm. Um, and she she's nine, she reminds me of this like every single time I see her. And I was like, look, you made it into the, into the class. Um, she's less appreciative. Point being, now that I've shown you both of those different aspects, it's pretty easy for you to see both points at once. It's pretty easy for you to hold in your head, oh, this is roughly correlated around the best fit line um, and pretty highly and tightly correlated, and these outliers are easily explained. But if you try to rewind back to when you saw this, those points probably didn't come through immediately. It's easier when you have one point at a time. So aim for, when you're creating these, one idea at a time. And if you have one idea that you are trying to make, then you can more easily actually figure out how to make good design choices that support that idea. And let's walk through a couple of ways to do that. All right, so one idea at a time. Another foundational way to communicate clearly for your audience is again to identify the point, have a point, and actually write it out as what we call a headline in what we're gonna argue is the most important part of your slide at the top, right? Seems simple, but let's take a look at an example. All right, oh, here we go. I hope at least some of you laugh a little. This is basically our data visualization version of a uh, stand-up comedy, like the, the Pac-Man <laughs> graph. Um, so, when you have this label distracting pie chart, is it actually making a point? Is it actually making a point about something? No, right, I, heard, I saw a few, a few, yeah, it's not, not really making a point. It's a label, right? It is essentially informative. It's telling us something about the graph. It's not actually making a point. It's not explaining that data or telling us anything about a key takeaway. So let's try another version. Here we are making a point. 88% of distracting pie charts look like Pac-Man, which is true, obviously, right? <laughs> so here is a point, right? And notice again, most important real estate of the slide at the top, we've put what we call a headline, right? It has a point, and it's conveying a point that the graph is showing at the top of the slide. Now there is a home for distracting pie charts. I should say the label distracting pie charts. We are actually not fans of pie charts, which is, ugh. we have strong <laughs> feelings about pie charts. Um, strong negative feelings about pie charts, I should say. Uh, just, there is a home for distracting pie charts, and that is actually right above the graph. That is simply a graph title, right? So 2023 sales by region, right? 24, 2024 predicted contribution margin, right? Simply, the graph title is just describing the data, whereas the headline is actually making your point. So how do you know if you have a headline? A couple tests you can use. Most important test, right, kind of a rule of thumb is it should pass the verb test. So you should see a verb, there should be a verb somewhere in the headline, right? 88% of distracting pie charts look like Pac-Man. If you don't have a verb, check to see if you may actually have a graph title, right? Are you actually making a point here? Now, when you have headlines in your deck, when you have headlines in all your slides, right, then you will have a deck that passes what we call the narrative test. When you have a headline that passes the verb test, you have a deck that passes the narrative test. Which means when you line up all of your slides in a row, and if you were to read all the headlines, they would form a coherent, clear narrative. So make sure your headlines pass the verb test, that will ensure that your full deck passes the narrative test. So that couple things to remember again, aim for 
one, one point at a time, identify the point, make sure it's clear at the top of your slide as the headline. And then one more tactic we'll talk about, which is maximizing the data ink ratio. Maximizing the data ink ratio. Anyone who's taken the class before remember the data ink ratio? You maybe? I know if you, I know if you took the class, you remember this. <laughs> Mira's so like, you're just you trying not to get called up. You gotta remember the data ink ratio. You get off that easily. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll give you some hints, see if it comes back to you. <laughs> All right, so think about it this way. Think about every pixel on the slide as ink, right? Just like ink on paper. You've got a few forms of data, of data and non-data ink. Data ink essentially tells us something about the data. It conveys information. It gives us signal about the underlying data. So examples of data ink. The bar in a bar graph is actually data ink. The line in a line graph, data ink. Right, the axes, the axes labels. Right, so it's actually telling us something about the data. Now, non-data ink, on the other hand, which I know we are all guilty of using, does not say anything about the underlying data. It is noise. Things like backgrounds, meaningless icons, excess color, right? Hue can actually be helpful in delineating or, or um, amplifying our point, but actually excess color, right? How many of you have made bar graphs that, you know, like have 10 different colors in them? Oh, come on. I know, I know you've done it. I know you've done it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Grid lines, especially heavy grid lines. Shadows, 3D. You've all used 3D, <laughs> especially anyone who's, who's uh, who remotely grew up close to the 90s, has used 3D, because this is when this functionality came out in PowerPoint. I know you've done it. Uh, and unnecessary boxes, right? So actually, when you make a graph in Excel, you know that default box around the graph, right? And you just paste it right into PowerPoint, and there's that box right around that graph. It doesn't actually tell us anything. None of these are telling us anything about the underlying data. In fact, it's clutter. It just gets in the way of your audience's understanding of the data. So what we want to do is try and optimize and amplify the data ink on the page and actually try and eliminate all the non-data ink. Right? Anything, again, that gets in the way of our message. What we're actually doing is trying to maximize, whoops, well, trying to ma give you a little preview. We'll maximize the data ink ratio. The idea here is taking out as much non-data ink as you can, it is noise, and amplifying the underlying data ink. Think of this as a signal-to-noise ratio. Now, what I want you to think about is making every pixel on the page justify its existence. That is the idea of maximizing the data ink ratio. We're gonna try to do this in real, we're gonna try to put you all to the test here. Um, this is the graph that haunts our nightmares. <laughs> this is, I get anxiety just looking at this graph. It's really frightening. Um, what I want you to do, just take two minutes. Take two minutes. Just, you can even just work with the person next to you. Try to list out the non-data ink that you would remove. Like, what is the clutter? What's getting in the way? And what changes might you make to better amplify the data ink, right? Take two minutes, and then I want to hear from a few of you on what changes you might make to this horrible, awful, nightmarish graph. All right. Hopefully you've come up with lots of things you want to do to this graph, because it needs some work. All right, let me just take a few things. You can either, let me raise, yeah, go ahead. Raise your hand, yeah. What, what's some changes you want to make? The grid lines, remove them, boxes. Get rid of those grid lines. Yeah. Because again, you know, you can argue that grid, some, in some cases, you know, can grid lines be helpful? Maybe, but they're usually not worth the additional clutter that they add. Look how much clutter they add, right? So removing those grid lines. You said the box, right? You don't need that box. It's not telling us anything. Both boxes, the box around the chart area and the box around the full graph, absolutely. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Yes, let's yeah. You're like, I'm ready to I'm ready to scroll down my list. Other folks. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, it's fun to see your audience all go like that. Um, <laughs> it's probably not worth that, right? So, so actually turning, uh, making this a horizontal bar would actually solve some of, the, some of the labeling issues. That's one way to solve some of the labeling issues. Way too many digits on these numbers. Yeah, extraneous digits, both in the data labels and in the y-axis. So you can imagine, right, uh, on that first bar, you can imagine 60, you know, 65K, which is the dollar sign. You can imagine just reducing the extraneous digits, right? Let's come over here. Anyone want to throw some things out? Yeah, go ahead. So we discussed a lot of things, but one thing I just noticed. The shadows, yeah. <laughs> Do we need these bars to float? No, we do not. We don't need, we're not watching a 3D movie. We don't, we don't need them to float. Take out the shadows. A lot of these are defaults in Excel, right? Someone at one point thought this was a great idea to put into the Excel defaults, right? So it's actually training yourself to make those changes is important, okay? I, I saw a hand here, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is actually subject to debate, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so actually there's a few choices you could make. You could potentially get rid of the y-axis labels and keep the data labels, or vice versa, right? And actually what I want you to think about is what, what conversation are you trying to have, right? Because you can imagine having the data labels on there and with, without the y-axis uh, or y-axis labels there, you can more easily see the values of each bar. So if you're having a conversation where you want to directly and clearly compare the values of each of those bars, you might want to keep the data labels on. Now, when you remove the data labels, you can more easily see kind of the shape, the shape of the graph and more easily see the overall trend and pattern. So that's the kind of debate you can think about. What else? I see, still see a couple of things I really want to do here. What are some other things? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Are those colors meaningful? No, they're not meaningful, right? I sometimes hear this argument of people go, but it's pretty. <laughs> well, you know, as much as I think, as much as Miro and I think this is art, it's not, it's not really, like our focus is not actually on the, the aesthetics for aesthetic sake. It's about how do we showcase the underlying data? How do we create that clear window into the data? So actually using one, one hue, Right? Would perhaps solve that. Yeah, in the back. So having a point. Yeah, so actually having a point and putting that point in the headline. And then once you have that point, then you have a better understanding of what to design around. Right? A couple other quick, let's do a couple other quick ones and then we'll just wrap up. Go ahead. Yeah, and we'll take this last one. Remove the graph. There's no need for a graph. <laughs> Remove the graph. <laughs> I mean, look like <laughs> an interesting point, right? It's like, think about what your point is, what relationship you're trying to show, and whether you need a graph or a table, right? All these are decisions, and we'll give you the last word. I was going to say, do you have to actually go to the zero point? Okay, so you could truncate the y-axis. Here's the, here's the challenge on truncating the y-axis, and I'll try to do this in record time, right? Because we're a little short on time here. What is, the, um, what is the con of that? What is the problem with truncating the y-axis? Yeah, in the back. It distorts the trend. Yeah, so it'll distort, it'll magnify the effect of small differences. So with bar charts, that's one reason why we say don't truncate the wax is because it'll exaggerate the effect of small differences. But there are other graph forms you can use if small differences matter. So really nice job, right? You can imagine all the things that you could do to make changes here. And here is a version that incorporates many of your changes. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And so like, look, notice what the effect is here, the focus on the underlying data. This is not about dumbing down the data. There is this inherent richness and complexity in the data that we want to present. The key here is keeping it as simple as possible. And this is, I believe Albert Einstein did say this, although I know there's been lots of arguments on what he really did and didn't say, but um, keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler. That's the idea of maximizing the data ink ratio. All right, we'll do one last and important tactic to be a more effective communicator. All right, last thing, last thing. 
And, and I am on a quest for this. Um, when I go, sometimes Arthi and I give this as a keynote, or we do workshops um, in companies, we do trainings on this as well. And this is probably the biggest thing that people miss and is critical, which is to, is to make your comparisons visually explicit. So, here an example here, it's the kind of graph I see all the time, is uh, new product sales have been weak. And there's a comparison here of the sales of a specific product. And you may look at that and you might say, oh, that looks weak, or you might look at that and say, I don't know. Um, but you can't formally know, because all this single line does is compare sales at one point in time with sales at a different point in time. In order for us to make any evaluation of good, bad, strong, weak, quickly, slowly, anything basically that has an adverb in it or has any qualitative judgment in it, you need some point of comparison. And so here is a potential point of comparison, right? Sales at predicted monthly sales from what we expected. Now, I think people are often afraid of this, especially people early in their careers, because one of these lines feels exact and one feels inexact, which is the projection line. People are also often afraid, oh, if I get into this meeting, there's going to be an argument, which there is probably going to be an argument. There's going to be an argument about whether or not this is the right thing to compare this data to. But when people fear that argument, I think they forget the conversation that you're likely to have with this which is, wait, what system did you get this out of? Wait, how are you measuring monthly sales? Where did you cut off the month? Well, what about February? It's got fewer days in it than March. How should, we, <laughs> how should we think about that in the sales projection? So it's not like you're not going to have a discussion and a conversation. The goal is to have that conversation focused on the right thing, which I think should be, what are we comparing this to? I also have a belief, I think we are likely to see over the next couple of years, a bunch of the things that we've talked about today are going to get a lot easier inside of programs and technology. It's going to be a lot easier to just say, through some sort of chat interface or AI interface, hey, take out all the excess ink. And you're not going to have to know where all the buttons are to do these things like you used to have to in the past. And what that means is your ability to do this, to figure out what is the appropriate point of comparison, what is the thing we should actually be comparing this to to make this decision, I think this skill is going to become more important and more valuable and more of a differentiator for good decisions. So as a general rule, think about visualizing a bunch of things you should always visualize. Um, goals, targets, averages, thresholds, uh, tolerances, ranges that this data should be inside of or outside of, making those comparisons visually explicit. Anytime someone gets up there and says, actually, basically, anytime someone has the word, as you can see, just like, if you notice yourself using that, make sure you can actually see that thing on the slide. Oh, as you can see, there's a really wide variation here. That's a comparison to something. It's a comparison to how narrow the variation should be. Think about having that visualized as well. Tolerances. All right, so now you know how humans take in information. Every mind decodes differently. We need to think about how we choose encodings that will be reliably decoded by our audience. But there is a problem in here, which is that we suffer from the curse of knowledge. The fact that we have done this analysis makes it hard for us to see things from the audience point of view. We need to make deliberate efforts to try and think about how we encode and represent information that can be decoded the way we intend it to. And some ways that you can think about making sure that you're doing that visually are to aim for one idea at a time, to identify the points you're trying to make each time, and write it as the headline at the top of the slide so that you can vi make sure your visual supports it. <laughs> think about the data ink ratio. What ink can you remove? How can you maximize the signal of the ink that remains? And make sure your comparison is visualized explicitly. I have a book that talks about these things. 
Um, everything we've talked about in here, as well as building logical arguments, telling competitive stories, also delivering slides with confidence, um, using the top D methodology, and handling challenging questions. We're gonna have a few minutes here to handle some challenging questions as well. I believe we've got a mic running. We've got five minutes, so we'll have time for probably two solid questions. It looks like we've got one up there, um, and for folks on it, probably Arthi and I will both spend some time answering, so just um, be careful on the mics. Hi, uh, your slide with comparing the ice cream sales with uh, temperature, yeah. you, you, the point you're making there is one point at a time. I noticed in the second slide, you overlaid point B, uh, the external factors with point A. So is the recommendation there to overlay your second point with the first point or do that individually? Yeah, so the point on this is to actually reveal one point at a time rather than two simultaneously. So in this case, it was more the idea that I built to it. I showed one, and then I added in the second one. There's a subtle, subtle thing you couldn't completely see there, which is when I added in the second point, I actually faded out the best fit line to make it less visually prominent. So it isn't that your audience can't see multiple points. It is that it's very hard for them when they're both presented at, the, two or more are presented at the same time, to parse them out. One of the ways you can manage that is to kind of show one, then overlay another one, then overlay another one. I guess to, um, they, 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 the alternative is there for point B to not show point A at all. Yeah, that is, is, abso that that is absolutely an alternative. You could decide, and this is the critical thing, is people are like, oh, I did all this analysis. You gotta see all the things that I learned. If you figure out what your point is, then that will actually make it a lot easier for you to be like, oh, actually, the correlation's not what's important here. The outliers are important, or vice versa. You could decide the correlation is important, the outliers are not super important. Um, it is just getting deliberate about the point you're trying to make and then designing for that, rather than trying to do, look at how much work I did. There's so much I wanna show you that I did. Get really clear on the point. All right, we got some others? Got one over here? Yeah, so what have we learned in this work that's different than Edward Tufte? Um, a lot of our work here builds on the work of Edward Tufte. The fundamental thing that Tufte brought in was this idea of the data ink ratio. Oh, sorry, we do. How many people up here have heard of Edward Tufte? Okay, so Edward Tufte is the only name in data visualization anyone has ever heard of. So it's a little on us that we didn't say the name Edward Tufte enough times in this presentation, because <laughs> when you tell people you went to a data visualization presentation, inevitably people are going to ask about Edward Tufte. Edward Tufte wrote a book in 1983 called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. It is a book-length essay um, that restarted the field. The two foundational ideas from Tufte at that time, one is this idea of the data ink ratio and this idea of non-data ink, which we are very much amplifying here. The other critical idea that he had was graphs cannot distort the underlying visuals, which was a really significant trend. I think the things you sort of see, for just a quick historical thing, you sort of see after Tufte, you kind of see him reset all of data visualization, and you see two major two major strains emerge from that, with a bunch of threads off each one. One thread that this more emphasizes is the idea of graphs that maximize efficiency of information transfer, which is primarily what we teach here, which is primarily what you are gonna use in a day-to-day -day business decision-making environment. And this amplifies on Tufte. The big thing that Tufte sort of assumes is that data should only ever be written and I don't think he has a nuanced understanding of the idea of a presentation that has a person presenting it. I think he makes a bit of an error in assuming that he's seen certain slides that when a slide designed to be presented by a person is sent around with no person attached to it, that they lose context and they can be dangerous. And he has examples of people dying from bad mistakes that were made there. But so one strain is this idea of amplifying sort of efficiency. There is another sort of art-oriented strain that comes out of Tufte that applies his principles of being really clear, um, but aims to create things that are more intricate and visually beautiful. And you see that more on infographics and things that are designed to be viral and to be sent around. Um, not as much what we've talked about here today because we've focused on day-to-day -day business decision making. Do we have time for one more or are we... Uh, we have time for one more, I think, very fast. Last one. 
On photos, rely, it's very important uh, the, the uh, disposition of uh, different items uh, and uh, the way people look at uh, things from right to left, uh, yeah. uh, up to down. Is it relevant also in data presenting? Yeah, I'll take this, I guess, because it's reasonably theoretical. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> interesting. Um, the research on this is, which is that people go through very heterogeneous visual paths through slides that actually there's not one common path. Some people appear to look first at the text, some people appear to look first at the visual, and that the thing to remember is that there's actually no common visual path through slides. The one that is the most common is really only done by like 20 to 40% of people. The eye tracking studies are all over the place on this. But that it's sort of very roughly a scanning pattern like this. But that's only like, 80% of people are not doing that. That said, people tend to look at the things, first the things they look at are human faces, then the things they tend to look at are the things that are the biggest, and then the things they tend to look at are the things that are the most visually prominent, and actually figuring that out is sort of a complex concept. So, um, I'll do this and then I'll give time for maybe one last sentence from you as well, uh, but I just want to think about um, things to think about coming away from today is to really respect that communication happens in the minds of the audience. And so being really clear when you are attempting to communicate information to not think about what is it that I'm trying to convey, but to think about what are they trying to receive. The last thing I'll leave you with is when we are in the analysis, right, and you're you're cutting the data all these different ways and creating these complex graphs, our, temp our temptation is to take that last graph and take it to the audience and go, hey, look at what I did, right? Look at this complex work I did. Don't take the last graph you made in your analysis and use it to explain your work, right? Think about the insight you're trying to show, think about it from the audience's perspective, and try to simplify to amplify the underlying data. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>